First question, so remember answer within the time limit. Right? Answer within the time limit. <coughs> so number one, tribal provisions are called in Arabic. What is the Arabic term for tribal provisions? <coughs> tribal provisions are called? Zad. Azad. Yeah, yeah, we did that. I remember we mentioned a book by Ibn Qayyim. He wrote a book called Zad al Ma'ad, which is translated as Provisions for the Hereafter. <coughs> Azad is tribal provisions, right? Which can be food, drink, and we also said that it can also include the knowledge for the, the person who's traveling. All right, next question. narrated from blank that he told a man he does not know not not really know a person unless they are neighbors they business together or travel together all right this is state this is from who narrated from who Umar. Umar it's not a hadith it's from Umar when a man was praised in front of him and he asked him do you are you a neighbor of that person did you do business with that person or did you travel with them the man said no to all of them he said then you don't really know him all right next question Prophet ﷺ said, travel is a portion of mercy. True or false? False. All right, so this is false. Why? Because the hadith is a portion of punishment. Asafru qit'atu min al adab Not mercy, punishment. All right, next question. From the dispensations of travel is that a traveler may wipe on the leather socks for a period of how many days? All right, so if you're traveling, you can wipe for how many days? Three days. <clears throat> Three days along with the nights. And for a resident? One. One day and one night. All right, next question. Shortening prayers in Arabic is called what? All right, shortening prayer is called Qasr. Qasr al Salah. All right, next question. Dhuhr comes in while the person is in a state of travel. By the time the person is ready to perform Dhuhr, They've already arrived at their residence. How should they pray? All right, so how should they pray? Four, four right? Because the condition for shortening is that you have to be a, a traveler when the salah came in and when you offered it as well. <clears throat> so once you return home, then you're no longer a traveler. All right, next question. Traveler arrives in a town on a Monday night. She intends to leave on Thursday morning. How should she pray? All right, so how should she pray? As a traveler, all right, for the entire duration. We're, we're not, we, don't, we don't count Monday night because that's the day of travel. We don't count Thursday. So it's really Tuesday and Wednesday, which is by consensus, everybody says you're a traveler at that point, two days. All right, uh, next question. Combining two prayers by, together by bringing the second prayer earlier in the time of the first prayer is called what? All right, so this is called jam'u taqdeem. Right? Jam'u taqdeem. When you're bringing the, the later prayer forward. All right, uh, next question. All right, a traveler intends to combine Dhuhr and Asr together at the time of Dhuhr, after praying Dhuhr. He decides to write a lengthy Facebook post about his vacation. 
After he writes the post and he attaches 100 selfies, he prays Asr while still in the time of the Hur. Is Salah correct? All right, so what's the, what's the status of his Asr? Only the Hur is good. Right? Only the Hur is good. He cannot pray Asr because he didn't pray right away afterwards. If you combine, you have to pray right away or enough, a bathroom break, a legitimate excuse that's not considered a long uh, break. All right, so what he has to do, he has to now wait for Asr to come in. The time for Asr, the original time for Asr to come in because he delayed without a valid reason the, the Asr afterwards. All right, next question. Which is the following is the condition for Jam'u Taqdeem. We just went over this term two questions ago. All right, so which of the following is the condition? All of it, right? All of it. <clears throat> this is when you bring the later prayer earlier, so you combine, combine Dhuhr or Asr in Dhuhr time, then you meet, need an immediate succession between the prayers. You have the intention to combine before finishing the first, and the sequence bring Dhuhr before Asr. You would, you would have to make the intention to delay. Just an intention to delay. Sequence is not required. Immediate succession is not required either. All right, next question. Uh, so this should be the last question coming up now. Which of the following prayers cannot be shortened during travel? All right, so which one cannot be shortened? Maghrib, right? You cannot pray two or, th or one. Maghrib has to be three. <clears throat> All right. Oh. It's my third. And M second, Ahmed first. Who's Ahmed? Ahmed? Oh, mashallah. Very good. Very good. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> All right. So we're going to continue, inshallah, from where we left off. Um, so we have. Um, an hour, okay. <clears throat> so, all right, before we begin, just some house rules. I know you guys have a lot of questions. So, we don't want to leave the question to the end because I know sometimes questions come up, but let's have it in designated sections, all right? Designated sections so that uh, we can keep moving and then we'll pause for questions and then uh, take a, a set of questions and then move on, inshallah, so that we can keep the class uh, organized, inshallah. All right. Um, so we, we went over, the last thing we did was the conditions for jam'u ta'khir, which is the, bringing the, the earlier prayer later, right? Delaying the prayer, uh, for example, dhuhr, delaying it into asr time, or delaying maghrib into isha time, right? We, we did that. All right, uh, conditions to shore and combine. We actually wanted to cover this last week, but we didn't get a chance to, but this is um, something that we were trying to get uh, covered. Uh, this is also very important, which is, what is the conditions for shortening and combining in general. All right, the first is uh, distance, all right? Distance in how much you have to travel. All right, so the four madhahib, the four madhahib, uh, they pretty much all agree that you have to travel a certain distance before you are allowed to shorten or combine or be in a state of travel, all right? Uh, this is the position of the four madhahib. Three of the madhahib have this, uh, which is about 80 kilometers, 81 kilometers, 50 miles. The Hanafi Madhab is a bit more, I believe, uh, or around. Right, uh, yeah, um, there's, some, there's some details on that. There's some details on that, but uh, more or less around the same. All right, so this is the position of the four Madhab, which is that uh, you have to intend to travel a certain distance before you can shorten or combine the Salah. All right, and this will be about 81 kilometers, 50 miles. 81 kilometers or 50 miles. Uh, we'll come back to this afterwards. The second condition is you need to have a specified destination. Right? You have to have an intention, a specified destination. And the third is the reason for travel must not be disobedience. The reason for travel must not be disobedience. All right, we'll come back to all of these, inshallah. Let's um, look at the first condition, which is that the journey must be at least 81 kilometers uh, one way. Now, where does this start from? 
Where does, so if, let's say you want to travel to a certain city. Where would you calculate the distance from? From your house? From the end, end of your town. From the end of your town. All right, so we went over the discussion of your town, right? We said that uh, it could be either the whole New York City or Queens, all right, or maybe South Ozone Park. Wherever your town is, right? Wherever you consider your town, the, the, the limits of your town, from when you, because that's when you become, you know, that's when you, you cannot, you cannot be a traveler in your town, right? So you have to leave your, the, your town. So you leave your town from the edge of your town, the end of your town, to where you're traveling, the city that you're traveling to. If it is 81 kilometers, then you are allowed to shorten or combine. All right, you're allowed to shorten or combine. But when can you start shortening combining? We went over this last week. When you leave, right? So you don't have to travel this amount of distance before you can start shortening or combining. But you need to intend to, the, the place that you're going needs to be this amount, all right? And as I said, this is the position of the four madhahib. There is an alternate position, all right? An alternate position, which has become popular and it's a lot easier too as well. Which is, which is that whatever is customarily known as travel, that is considered travel. And they don't base it on distance, all right? So whatever is customarily based on travel would be considered travel, and you can, you can shorten it and, com and combine your, your salah as long as you would customarily be considered a traveler. And they would not consider any specific distance, all right? But obviously this position, uh, it is very subjective. Right, because who's a traveler then? Is this person a traveler? That person is a traveler. So this, this position of the four madhahib is a lot, more, uh, it's a lot easier to follow because there's a certain distance that you know. You travel this distance, you can shorten and combine. If you don't travel this distance, you don't shorten and combine. All right? So um, for those who are at the, the picnic right, last week, that distance was under 81 kilometers. So that's why I didn't shorten or combine. All right? That's why I didn't shorten and combine. For those who who say that you know, we are customarily considered to be traveling, then they would shorten and combine. Or those who went, came from New Jersey or came from deep in Long Island, they would be able to shorten and combine, all right? Uh, yeah, it was just underneath. It was just underneath. So, but the condition for shortening and combining is that you have to be certain, be certain that you're traveling the distance. Because uh, shortening and combining is a rukhsa, it's a dispensation. And so in order for you to apply a dispensation, you have to be certain that you, you've met the conditions of the dispensation. If not, then you have to go back to the default, which is praying the salah in its, correct, in its correct time and in its full form. So what is the proof for this position of 81 kilometers? Uh, this is the position of the sahaba, a number of sahaba, as it's uh, uh, written here, Al-Bukhari is related. While commenting in the book on shortening the prayer in the chapter on the required distance for shortening the prayer, that Ibn Umar and Ibn Abbas would shorten their prayers and not fast if they were traveling for uh, Burud, which is 16 Farsakh, which is uh, some uh, form of, of, of um, calculating um, distance at, th at those times. And it is equivalent to approximately 81 kilometers. You might see sometimes 83 kilometers, 87. There's, there's a difference in how to calculate it, but this is uh, more or less around this amount, 81 around. Yeah, the miles would be 50 miles. The miles would be 50. So this is the, this is the uh, established uh, position of Ibn Umar, Ibn Abbas, and other, and other Sahaba as well. And uh, the scholars have mentioned that they would not do something like this unless it was from certain knowledge from the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In other words, they wouldn't, sometimes the Sahaba, they, they would take a position based on ijtihad, which is that they didn't have anything specific from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but they made their, they exercised their judgment and they arrived at a, uh, at a ruling. Right? For something like that, then it's not necessarily a, a proof if a sahabi made ijtihad because their, their position can be correct or incorrect. Right? Their position can be incorrect or incorrect. But there are certain things that if a sahabi says it, um, depending on what they're talking about, it could only be from Rasulullah SAW. Like if a sahabi says something about ilm al ghaib something from the unseen. Right? The sahabi says something that this is uh, about something from the unseen then there's no way that they could have arrived at by their own conclusion. So they have to have gotten it from Rasulullah even if they don't say it. Right? Even if they don't say it. So certain things like this, maybe they, it might have been from their own ijtihad, or they, may, they might have gotten it from Rasulullah right? uh, so, But the scholars have mentioned that something like this, 
it's very difficult that they would specify a specific, specific amount or specific distance, right? Uh, unless this was something that they got from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right, so this is the, uh, the proof of this position that it is based on a certain distance, uh, which is four burud, uh, which is 16 farasak, equivalent to 81 kilometers or around uh, 50 miles or so. All right, the second condition uh, in order for a person to be able to combine a shortening is that the journey must be towards a specified known destination. Someone who's confused is not considered a traveler. It's the the, the fuqaha mentioned in the books of fiqh that the person who is a ha'im, ha'im is like a, a person who has ham worry. You know, sometimes a person, you're, you're depressed, you're, you're, you, you, you know, you're, your mind is all over the place, so you just get in your car and you start driving. Right? Or a person gets in that, back in those days, they get in their horse and they just start riding or start walking. And they cover the distance of travel, but they didn't intend to travel. They just, they're trying to just get, out, get away. They're, they're depressed, they're worried. So this person would not be allowed to shorten or combine. Right? Because they, when they left, they didn't have that intention that they're traveling. All right? And the same thing for, goes for people who are like traveling with a group, but they don't know where they're going. So they're just following somebody who's going, who's traveling, the leaders taking them somewhere. And they don't know where they're going, then this person also uh, would not be allowed to shorten and combine because they don't have that intention of travel. So you have to have the intention of travel. All right, this is applies to on their way as they're traveling. All right, but once they have met the distance, then they can they can shorten and combine. All right, so let's say a person they, they they left their house depressed and they just started driving and strolling, and uh, they're driving, they're not allowed to shorten and combine while they're driving until they actually cover that 81 kilometers. Once they've covered that 81, 81 kilometers, now they can shorten or combine. Right? As opposed to a normal person who's made the intention, when, they can, when can they start combining and shortening? When they, when they leave the, 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 the town, right? when they leave the town. But for the person who, who did not make that intention, they have to actually cover that distance. They have to cover the full distance of 81 kilometers and then they can start, start shortening or combining. Because when they left, they didn't have that intention that they were traveling. All right, so as I said, this, the above only applies if one has not traversed the required distance. But once they have traversed that distance, then they can shorten. Because at that point, they're certain that they've covered the distance. Yes. Yeah, once, once you meet the required distance, then you can shorten and combine as long as, as long as you have not come back to your town. Once you come back to your town, then you're no longer a traveler. But right. I'm just passing by. Passing by where? Like, I mean, I'm coming, bringing the people, I'm like picking up with the people and coming back on my way to like the JFK and the Wadiya, but I'm coming back to uh, sometime like uh, I came by by cruising on the road. I'm living here. Right, once you come back to, once you come back to your town, then you're no longer a traveler, okay. right? Once you come back to your town. Yeah, oh, he's passing through. Okay. Okay. All right, let's, let's come back to that afterwards. We'll say that for, for after, inshallah. All right, the third condition is <clears throat> uh, that the reason for traveling is not disobedience. All right, now there's some details with this. There's a difference between a person who has initiated the travel for disobedience, right? Initiated the travel for disobedience versus a person who has disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while traveling. Right? There's a difference between the two. So the person who has initiated that travel for disobedience, they are not allowed to shorten and combine. Right? So a person traveled to pick up some alcohol, or they travel to steal, or do anything else haram. The purpose of their travel is for disobedience, then this person is not allowed to shorten or combine. They're not considered a traveler. Right? And this is because the traveling is a rukhsah, and uh, there's a qaida fiqhiyah that الرخص لا تناطو بالمعاصي That the, the dispensations are not afforded to disobedience or those who are engaged in disobedience. So if a person has initiated the travel for disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they are not allowed to take the dispensation because this is a dispensation 
that Allah is allowing them to take and they're not deserving of it if they have initiated that travel for disobedience. As opposed to a person who along the way they disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then this, they're still allowed to shorten command because everybody falls under the, that category of, of, of sinning, being a sinner and, being, and committing mistakes. Right? So if we make that condition that you cannot commit any sins before you can shorten and combine, then nobody would be able to shorten and combine. Right? So this applies to the person who has initiated their travel on disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That person is not uh, allowed to shorten or combine and not considered a traveler. All right. Um, all right. So let's pause here. Any questions on, on these conditions? Any questions on these conditions? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. I bring someone at the airfield. It took me two hours to get back. And it took me like an hour, like 80 miles, uh, 85 miles, so I came back. Now, I'm going to go back upstate New York to drop somebody for like a maximum mile. So where I stand. Okay, so you drop somebody upstate? No, I uh, pick somebody up. You pick somebody up. Upstate, okay. Bring them back to the mm -hmm. Right. Again. Right. So, what, what, where I stand? So, in that, in that first trip, in that first trip, because you covered a certain amount, the, uh, amount of miles, you, you, would, you would have been a traveler, right? But when you're coming back now, you're coming back to your, to your destiny, your town, right? Once you passing come back. By, not like right, you're passing by, but. Not like me right. Home. My is like just passing by. Right, but you're still coming back to your town, right? You're still passing coming back by. to your town? So once, you know, once you're still coming back to your town, then you're no longer a, a traveler, all right? You're no longer a traveler. But once you start that second journey, that second trip, you're back to traveling again. So you'll just wait until you leave the city again, and then you can, you can start shortening and combining. So it's going to be an hour Yes. Yeah, once you leave the city again, because he, the second trip, he's going, he's going for, he's going the distance, right? Yeah. Your house is where? Yonkers? Yonkers. Yonkers, okay. I did not go home though. Okay, oh no, okay. So if you, if you didn't go home, if you didn't come back home, you're still a traveler, right? As long as you have not entered back into your town, all right? While I'm staying here, yeah. like I mean, for three hours or two hours, whatever, yeah. am I going to be still a traveler? In here, in New York City? Yeah. No, you'll, you'll, yeah, you'll be still a traveler. Okay. Yes. I mean, because you're not, you're, not a, you're not a New York City resident, right? You're not, you're not a resident of New York City. New York City? Yes. Yeah. You're Yonkers. Yonkers. Right. So as long as you're here, yeah, you're, you're, still, you're still considered a traveler. What about like um, uh, praying with um, Jamaat over here, like I mean, uh, praying with like Jamaat, so uh, three parts and like I mean, four parts for the Isha as well, so it, it follows the law. Okay. So you, you have a choice. You can, if you, you can come here, you can pray Maghrib and you can pray your Isha afterwards, right afterwards. You can do that. Or you can wait and you can pray with the Jamaat. It's up to you. It's up to you. All right, any other questions? Yeah. So to start off, when we start to get to the Wadi, to the Tijari, mm -hmm. the long days and the burden of these conversations you are going to mm -hmm. change your mind. You don't want to, you want to go a little bit later. Yes. The same thing when you're leaving the Wadi. Yeah, okay. So the scholars have mentioned that as well. If a person changes their intention halfway through. So they initiated their travel on disobedience. So the initial ruling is that they can't shorten and combine. But somewhere along the way, they changed their mind and they repented. So what they would do is they would look at where they are and where is the distance to where they're going. And if that distance is traveling distance, then they can combine and shorten. If it's not, then they would have to wait till they cover that distance. All right? So it depends. They have to look at where they are at the time of repentance. So if they're halfway through and there's still uh, a lot of of, of miles to cover, enough to meet that requirement of the distance, then they would be able to sh shorten and combine. Allahu Akbar. So this is the, per yeah. Yeah, okay. Should 
Okay, so. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. Yeah, so that second question. Uh, yeah, so the, the question is a person intends to stay for more than four days, right? Four days. Can they shorten and combine while they're on the journey? So the answer is yes, right? As they can shorten and combine as they're on the journey. Once they reach that destination, then they become a resident because they've intended to stay more than four days. But as they're traveling, they have, that, they have the, the, the ruling of being a traveler as they're traveling. But once they reach that destination and they've intended to stay there for more than four days, then the minute they reach that destination, now they're no longer a traveler. Now they're no longer a traveler. All right? But as, they're, as, as long as they're on the journey and they have not reached their destination, they are considered to be a traveler and they can shorten and combine. All right, the, the issue about uh, traveling without a mahram. So this is a position of vast majority of scholars that uh, a woman is not allowed to travel the, the, the traveler, a distance of a traveler, without a mahram. All right, this is position of vast majority of the scholars. Um, for hajj, you, there is, um, I think there are some scholars who allow, if there's a group of women, if there's a group of women, they can go with a group of trustworthy women. They've made that uh, exception for the hajj because of its uh, status as an obligation. All right, um, that's specific for the hajj. Other than that, the vast majority of scholars, uh, and this is based on a hadith that Rasulullah says that a woman should not travel the distance of a night and day without a, a, a mahram. Um, there are some, you know, there are some other hadith that seem to indicate that this is uh, might be based on circumstances. Uh, for example, uh, there's a hadith in which Rasulullah says that there, a time is going to come when a woman is going to walk from Sanaa to Medina or some. Between the, two, between the two, two cities, I don't remember the exact cities, and she will not fear anyone except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, indicating that she's maybe traveling alone. Uh, so so there's, there's some who say that this is, uh, the, the intent was that this is a time when it was not safe. However, of course, the safest is to uh, abide by the position of the majority, which is that uh, avoid traveling without a mahram, the distance of a traveler. Allah Allah. All right, last question, and then we'll move on, inshallah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. We get the mic. All right. Uh, so a lot of this presupposes that somebody has um, a place that they reside that is static, right? Yes. So, but there are some situations where people do not have that. So if I live in a van, for example, and I move from place to place, I don't know always where I'm going to go, but, you know, like, I don't have, like, a permanent fixed address. Mm -hmm. uh, another example is if, um, like, there are cruises that you can take that go around the world, for example, and financially it might be actually cheaper to do that than to have, like, a fixed housing. So some people do that as well, too. Um, so given that they don't have a fixed place of residence, how would you do, like, you know, yeah, travel so price the, and the, cases like that? The scholars have, have talked about this as well in classical fiqh. They've given the example of the captain of the boat who is constant state of travel. And they've said that that captain, he wouldn't, he, wouldn't, he, he wouldn't not be able to shorten and combine. I believe this position in the Maliki school, I don't know if any uh, other uh, madahib have position on that, but I know that the Malikis, they say that the person who's a captain of a ship and he's in constant state of travel, then he would not be afforded that because then his entire, his entire life becomes shortening and, and combining. So a person who is in that constant state of travel, then they would not have that dispensation. Allahu Akbar. Uh, what well, last question? We got to move on, inshallah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Okay, now I know like I got to go like, seven to the last to pick somebody up for a hundred miles. So and while I'm getting ready, so the road like time is stopped. Mm -hmm. Am I going to be consider myself as a like uh, what's it called? Uh, traveler. Traveler, or I'm going to play like the entire road. You're a traveler once you leave your town. Okay. All right. So as long as you're still in your town, then you're a resident. Okay. So what yeah. about Mm -hmm. So in the winter time, it's like really hard for us being a Muslim. Like, if like I pick somebody from, from like an Egypt, they're getting like hundred mile. So I mean, uh, uh, so I do not have a time to like pray for like okay, sometimes Zohar, sometimes Asr because like I'm traveling. Mm -hmm. Am I allowed to like while I'm traveling, I can pray or I can get there and uh, do like the uh, uh, after Namaz time one of it. So I have to do Asr. Traveling while you're, uh, you're traveling. driving, that's very dangerous, first of all. That would, that would be very dangerous. I, I heard that yeah. like the Sahaba, like, I mean, they were like, allowed to go, uh, 
Yeah, we spoke about this last, that's, that's, that's the voluntary prayers, right? But the fard prayers, you have to pray facing the Qibla, standing up, all right, as long as you're able to, all right? Um, but if you're traveling a long distance, you should be able to have a bathroom break, all right? A bathroom break, a gas, gas break. I mean, you, you should, you should try, to, try to get some kind of break. Yeah. Okay. Our company restrictions are very tough on that. Okay. Okay. So then when again I came in the interest so go quit the job. I mean after yeah, yeah well, well, let's let's discuss that afterwards inshallah. That's the specific situation. Okay. Those specific situations we can't give that that will require a fatwa, right? That will require a specific fatwa. That will not we can't give a blank ruling on that, inshallah. All right, uh, moving on. All right, so conditions to shorten combined, uh, at least eighty one kilometers, specified destination. Reason for travel should not be disobedience. All right, uh, so this is more or less we covered, you know, the, the, the fiqh of the travel. Uh, so lastly, we'll look at some uh, important travel-related issues. Uh, the first is facing the qibla, istiqbal qibla We know that you have to face the qibla for any form of prayer. You have to face the qibla. Uh, this is very simple when we're a resident. You come into the masjid, the, the masjid is already facing the qibla. All right, but when you're traveling, uh, the matter might get a bit more complicated. It's a lot easier now. Uh, we have the phones, we have the compass, so it's very simple to, you know, to get, uh, find the direction of the Qibla. Uh, the issue though comes up that sometimes the phone might, you know, it's not reliable sometimes. You might have a compass and you're relying on the phone, you might have one, or two or three different apps, they're all saying different directions. All right, so what do you do then? Yeah, you, you use your best judgment, you try to look at the, the signs, the sun, the position, the sun and so on, and you pray, but if you Later on, find out that you prayed in the wrong direction, and you, you know you know you prayed in the wrong direction. Then you have to repeat that salah, all right? So, you pray, and you, you you try your best to find the direction of the qibla. But if you know and you, you come to the conclusion that you for sure you, you made a mistake, and you prayed uh, west when it should have been east, then that salah you would make up, all right? That salah you would make up. Now, when it comes to the qibla, uh, there's no difference of opinion. Is that uh, amongst the scholars that if you can see the Kaaba, then you have to face Ayn al Qibla. Right? You have to face the actual Qibla, meaning that if you were to put a line from where you are, it would go and it would hit the Kaaba. If you are able to see the Kaaba. Right? So there's very much no difference of opinion that if you, are, if you can see the Kaaba, that you have to face the exact direction of the Kaaba to the point where if you would put a straight line, that you would, it would hit the Kaaba, it would touch in the Kaaba. Now, if you cannot see the Kaaba, if you cannot see the Kaaba, the preferred position is that you still have to pray in a, in a way that you would still meet the Kaaba, right? Um, that's the preferred position. There is another uh, position which is that you would face Jihatul Kaaba, not necessarily Ainul Kaaba, not the, the actual Kaaba, but the general direction of the Kaaba. And there is some hadith on this which Rasulullah says that Ma bayn al Mashriqi wal Maghrib Qibla, that whatever is between the East and the West is the Qibla. So this is an alternate position, and this is a lot. Uh, a lot, a lot more lenient position to follow, which would allow something like a um, like a 45 degree um, leeway, as long as you're not into the other direction, right? As long as you're not into the uh, other direction, then you would. Uh, you, so that you, let's say you, you you're supposed to pray northeast, you pray east. It's not quite into the other direction. It's like a, within that 45 degrees um, of leeway, then you would not have to make up that salah afterwards. All right. So, but the, the preferred position is that you face the exact direction of the qibla, um, and and this would be like uh, I think here we are in, in New York is like north northeast, right? Um, there's a specific number, right? What is that number? So 41, right, or or so, or so right? So you tried to get that exactly, all right, um, and that's the preferred position, position that you face that exact uh, direction of the qibla, all right. If you can't, then you do your best to, to see what direction. Uh, the, is the direction of the Qibla. But if you later on realize that you faced a complete different direction, right? It wasn't like the northeast or, and then east. It was like north, it was uh, south, right? Or west. You completely got the direction uh, mixed up. Then you would repeat that salah, right? You would repeat that salah. All right, so that's for facing the Qibla. As we said, though, uh, as we live in modern times, it's a lot easier now to figure out the direction of the Qibla due to the, you know, if you have a, you have a compass or you have uh, any of those uh, Qibla apps. 
Uh, salah time, same thing for the salah times, right? Yeah. All right, so the plane, the plane is a bit different. Depending on what, time, what type of uh, plane you're, you're traveling in, the, you actually can't see the direction, all right? If you look at the map, all right, there's, a, there's like a travel map on pretty much all the, all the screens, and it will show you where, where you are. You can see if you're facing the Qibla or not, all right? So uh, usually you can, especially in like international travel, you can see, you can see the direction. Right? Um, but the plane travel, that's, a, that's um, a separate issue because then you also have the issue of standing, or you're able to, can you pray sitting, or can you, you're allowed to pray sitting on the airplane um, and uh, facing, if you're not facing the Qibla, what do you do then? So that's, that's a, a specific scenario. I think we'll, let's come back to that at the end, all right? the issue of the praying on the airplane. All right, awqat uh, salah the prayer times. Prayer times, so once again, right? Uh, living in modern times, it's a lot easier now. We have the, uh, all the Adhan apps. So even wherever you're traveling, you can know all the Salah times. So it's not, um, it's not anything uh, difficult. It's very simple. You, you, know, you just look at where your location is, and you can figure out all the Salah times. Uh, so, uh, but of course, it's still important to pray the, the Salah. Uh, make sure that you're praying it uh, in the correct timings. All right, then we have uh, the last issue, which is Hukm al-Safar Yawm al What is the ruling of traveling on the day of Jum'ah? All right, so uh, as we know, there are certain people, which would be the adult resident male, who is obligated to perform Jum'ah. All right, so you are an adult resident male. You are obligated to perform Jum'ah. So are you allowed to travel on the day of Jum'ah uh, if you have met the conditions of Jum'ah being obligatory on you? Right, and, and, the, and the scholars have mentioned that, uh, and there's a few different positions. Preferred position is that it is not permissible to travel after Fajr, right? After Fajr on the day of Jum'ah, unless you know that you're going to be able to catch Jum'ah somewhere else. All right, so unless you know that I'm going to be able to catch Jum'ah somewhere else, then that will be allowed. So you have a flight, and you know, the flight is going to land at a certain time, and you know that you can make Jum'ah in the next town, in the next city, then you can travel. But if you don't know, then it would not be permissible to travel on uh, Friday morning. On Friday morning. So if you're, and this is uh, you know, general advice, that if you're booking flights, avoid booking on Friday morning. Right? If you're looking for flights or you're planning trips, uh, avoid doing that on Friday morning. Right? So that you don't miss the Jum'ah. Unless you know for sure you're going to be able to catch the Jum'ah. Because once you've entered into Friday, then Jum'ah becomes due on you. You've, you've entered into Jum'ah, Jum'ah becomes due on you. And so it would not be permissible to travel uh, on the day of Jum'ah unless you know that you are going to catch Jum'ah somewhere else. All right. Um, all right. So any questions on these uh, related issues in the back first? Yeah. Let's say if, if, if you're traveling the day of Jum'ah, Friday morning from state to state, mm -hmm. right? And is it possible to make Jum'a after 2 p.m.? You have to make Jum'a when, whenever the, the, the masjid is making a Jum'a, right? Jum'a you cannot do it by yourself. So if you find a masjid that's doing Jum'a at 2, 2 p.m., 2.30 p.m., then okay. Right? But, but you have to, the, the Jum'a has to be done in the masjid in the Jum'a. Yeah. If... Uh, so if you are traveling already on the journey, yes, it's it, you're in the middle of your stay. You traveled on Wednesday, mm -hmm. and Yamul Juma, you are still in the destination where you travel to. Yeah, um, Juma is not obligated on you because you're not a resident. Right, but you happen to be in a masjid and they're praying Salatul Juma, so you pray Salatul Juma. Uh, what's the ruling with regards to combining Asr? Uh, at that point. Yeah, so the, 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 the Jum'ah will take the place of Dhuhr and you can combine with Asr afterwards. You can combine yes. with Asr. You can uh, combine with Asr afterwards. Sure. Yeah. Um, so traveling on the day of Jum'ah. Uh, so Jum'ah is required on you once the time enters, right? Yes. 
So if you leave before the time enters, what would be the issue with traveling? Is it that, so the, the time of the horror uh, enters upon you while you are a traveler, mm. right? So like I'm trying to understand like the, like so the prohibition say, yeah. or the dislikeness so of that traveling on that day. The, that Juma became due on you on the Friday. The Friday, yeah, not just like when the, when, the not Friday when, night. Then you mean like not Thursday the Friday night. night, but when 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 you can make the the ghusl, which is in the morning, right? The the ghusl of the of the of the, the Juma, you can begin making the ghusl of the Juma in the morning, right? Uh, okay. After after the Fajr, so at that point, this is when you know Juma is basically you 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 you've, you become uh, due on Juma has become due on you at, at that point. At that point, meaning that you can that prepare for it, in the sense that if you travel and you miss it, then you have essentially uh, uh, intentionally left off Juma. But it wasn't required on you if you were traveling. So right? you, you you're traveling, but you did, you didn't travel uh, yet, right? You left before the prayer. You were like right. you were a bona fide traveler. Right. Yeah, the scholars mentioned. The, yeah, the scholars enters, mentioned that yeah. once you've entered into Juma on Friday, then the Juma became doing you, right? There there's other okay. positions. Okay. But this is the position that we're mentioning here. Okay. You had a question? No. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's according to what uh, the Hanbali Madhab allows it before, before the time. But generally, it is it is a Dhuhr time. But the but the, the the point they mention is that once you've entered Friday and you intentionally travel, then it's as if you are you are intentionally missing Juma, right? So that's that's the position. That's the the reason that they come from. Uh, there there's both positions. Both are mentioned, and some mentioned permissible as well. There are some scholars mentioned permissible as well. Yeah. So traveler is like gonna be. Is he allowed to like uh, combine the prayer or like I mean asr and zohar together or maghrib or isha together? Like if he has a doubt, like I'm not gonna make it isha or maghrib. Is he allowed to combine it or is he not allowed to combine it? Like he has to pray on the certain time. Like but once he's a traveler, he can he can sure he combine. Combine, yeah, once he's like traveled. Maghrib and Isha. But I mean, I, this is what I do for, for a living, and I do this every day. Okay, those specific questions we have to we have, we have to speak one on one, inshallah, about those because you have a, a specific job. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Huh? <laughs> yeah it's the captain. So, if you're uh, taking a road trip and your intention was to leave. For instance, you have a set amount of days for uh, your vacation. Your intention was to leave to come back on Jumar. It would be preferred to either leave before uh, Fajr, or if you can delay the trip uh, another day, or leave the day prior. Yes. yes. So if you okay. can, you, you travel before, uh, before the Fajr, right, in the, in the nighttime, or, or after. Jazakallah. That would be the best thing, and the safest thing to do as well. All right, uh, moving on. Etiquettes and manners of travel. All right, um, before you travel, it is recommended to settle any disputes. Now, the scholars, have, when they've mentioned these, of course, they've mentioned it uh, in the context of travel back in those days when you traveled, you know, you were actually away for a very long time. And there was a very good, distinct possibility that you might not return, right, depending on where you're going, right? So, of course, this would apply for more, you know, longer trips, trips that are, you know, you're, you're going away for a long time. But nonetheless, it's it is recommended even in residence, to settle any disputes. So uh, even more so when you're traveling. Before you travel, settle any disputes because nobody knows when they're coming back home. Right? Nobody knows that they're coming back home. Any disputes you have, you settle. Uh, settle those so that you don't have to settle them in the hereafter. So any disputes, you try to settle them. You owe somebody a debt. Uh, you have a problem with somebody, try to settle those things before, uh, before you travel because nobody knows if they're returning or not. Uh, same thing, repaying debts. Try to repay debts. Uh, all of this is so that you don't, uh, in case you pass away in your travel, you don't settle those uh, debts in the next life. You want to settle everything in this life. Any debt, any personal issue you have with anybody, anybody you wronged, all of these 
you try your best to settle them in this life. Because if you try to settle it in the next life, you have to pay with deeds. And nobody wants to give away their deeds on the Day of Judgment. All right, uh, make arrangements for one who must provide for. So, you know, you are a, a, a husband, for example, a father. You're ob obligated to provide for your, your wife, your children. If you're traveling, those obligations don't go away. So if you're traveling, you're still responsible to make arrangements. Uh, if you're not traveling with your, your children, you're not traveling with your, your wife, you still have to make those arrangements and make sure that they are provided for. And this, this is still within your obligation. Even if you're traveling, you just make sure that you make those arrangements beforehand. All right, returning trust. All right, somebody uh, entrusted you with something. Hold this money for me. Hold this, uh, uh, this precious item for me. You should return it. Uh, and there's a whole section in, in the books of fiqh about uh, traveling with a trust and whether you can travel with uh, the trust that you have for somebody or not. Uh, but the best thing is to make sure that you return all these trusts before you travel. All right? If you cannot find the person, let's say some, somebody asks you to hold uh, something for them, and you cannot find that person anymore, then you can, uh, if there's an Islamic ruler, you can find an Islamic ruler to give that. If not, then you put it in the hands of somebody else trustworthy. Right? You give it to somebody else trustworthy who is a resident. All right, but it is important that you don't travel. Uh, try your best not to travel with something that you've been trusted with. Uh, same, same thing uh, goes back to you don't know if you're going to be able to come back, and you, that would be a debt that you owe to that person. All right, um, we see this in the seerah of Rasulullah What is an example of that? Returning the trust. Right, the hijrah. Right? One of the reasons why he left Ali radiallahu behind, right? one of the main reasons was to return the trust. Right? One of the main reasons why he, he told Ali to stay behind is to return the trust that, that, that was owed to people. All right, traveling with good company, choosing an emir. Uh, the scholars have mentioned that it is disliked to travel by yourself. Right? It is disliked, and there are hadith on that. All right, there are hadith on that. Rasulullah SAW says that if a person knows, if, if anyone knew what I knew about travel, then a person would not travel by themselves. So it is disliked to travel by yourself. And even with two, uh, the hadith mentions that, um, that uh, one person is a shaitan. And two person is two shaitans. With thalatha raqb. And the, the three is would be considered to be company. All right? So you try to do at least three. This is recommended. Of course, there are certain situations where a person has to travel by themselves for work or, or, or any other reason. But you uh, should avoid traveling by yourself uh, due to the general... Uh, Statements of Rasulullah about uh, not traveling on your own and being in the company of people. And if you are in the company of people, then uh, it is recommended to choose an emir. Right? If you are in a group of people, then uh, one person should be appointed as the emir and uh, be responsible for decisions when they are traveling. Uh, good manners and speech. Of course, this applies to when you're a resident, but uh, even when you're traveling as well. And it might be especially important when you're traveling because especially you're traveling in uh, America, you know, this is an opportunity for da'wah as well. So you're traveling, you're going to a, a, a foreign city or a, a, a different city. The people of the town, maybe they don't know who Muslims are. So they're going to look at you and your behavior, and they're going to judge Islam based on that. So it is especially important when you're traveling that you uh, make sure that your manners and your speech are representative uh, re representing Muslims, re being representative of Islam and Muslims. Uh, bidding farewell, right? This is also uh, recommended when you before you leave, you bid for farewell to your fam your family, uh, and your friends. There are some uh, askar as well mentioned. Uh, of what to say? Anybody know uh, of some of the askar that you say? Yeah. Astaghfirullah. Yeah. Mm. Completed. It's an Hassan Muslim Abid here, inshallah. We can look at it over here, right? Uh, supplication of the traveler for the resident. Astawdi'ukum Allah, ladhi la tadi'u wa da'yuhu. Right? This is for the, tra uh, the traveler for the resident. So the traveler will say this to the resident. Uh, and the resident will also s can say this to the traveler, the one underneath. Astawdi'ullah hadinaka wa amanatak wa khawatima amalik. Right? Which means, I leave your religion in the care of Allah, as well as your safety and the last of your deeds. All right? So there's uh, du'as to say when bidding farewell to your family and friends. Of course, we know that there's also uh, du'as for uh, leaving, uh, or before we get to that, Salatul Istikhara, right? It's also uh, recommended, especially if it's an important travel, to pray Salatul Istikhara, right? This is the, 
the, the prayer that you pray when making decisions. Um, and this Salat al Istikhara, there's hadith on this in which Rasulullah, uh, the, the companion said that, Can Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yu'allimuna al Istikhara fi al umuri kulliha? That Rasulullah would teach us the Istikhara in everything, to do the Istikhara for everything, uh, to the point where even li uh, like learning a surah. Like he would teach them the Istikhara like they learn a surah. So it's not only for major things. Istikhara is actually, you can, you can make this Istikhara for even minor things, as the hadith mentions, that he would. So Rasulullah would teach them istikhara for everything, right? So even uh, in things that you might not see it as a major decision, make the istikhara. Um, even if it's not a major travel, you never know that this travel might not be good for you. It might not be beneficial for you. It might be harmful for you. So this is also recommended to, to perform salat al-istikhara. This is a two-unit prayer, and then there's a dua to say at the end. You can find these uh, duas in the uh, fortress of the Muslim or any other uh, dua book. All right, now of course we have the du'as for leaving the home and traveling. So first leaving the home. What is the du'a for leaving the home? Right, Bismillah tawakkaltu. Allah, wa la hawla wa la quta illa billah. Right, so this is the du'a for leaving the home. Make sure you say the du'a for leaving the home. And then the du'a for traveling. So there's a few of du'as for traveling as well. There's the du'a for the riding animal. Right, subhanallah, this is the one you would... Uh, would say when you're on the riding animal or the, or the car. All right, and then we also have uh, this other dua, the dua for traveling. All right, you can find all these in uh, the fortress of the Muslim. Allahumma hawwina alayna safarana hadha wa tu'anna bu'adahu until the end. All right, um, <clears throat> leaving in the morning, all right, is also from the recommendation to travel. Due to the general... Um, Blessings of the morning. Rasulullah says in hadith that Burika ummati fi fi bukuriha. That my, my ummah has been blessed in its mornings. So the morning is a specific time to, uh, to take advantage of because it's the time of blessings. It's the time of blessings. So if you can leave in the morning, then try to do so uh, because this is the time in which Rasulullah says that my ummah has been blessed in its mornings. All right, and lastly, being careful at night. All right, be careful at night. As we know, night is a time of evil. What does Allah say in Surah Al-Falaq? وَمِنْ شَرُّ غَاسِقٍ إِذَا وَسَقٍ All right, um, and from the, from the night when it uh, appears, right, or envelops. All right, so we seek refuge in the night. This is one of the things we seek refuge from. Right? The night is a generally a time of evil. So being careful when you're traveling at night, um, if you're driving at night, this is the time when the, you know, the, the harmful animals might come out and the harmful people as well, the shayateen from the ins and jinn, they come out. So being careful uh, at night is something uh, that a person should uh, be aware of as well. And if you have to travel at night, then taking your precautions. And of course, you know, if you traveling at night, maybe some coffee might be helpful so you don't fall asleep uh, on the road. All right, so these are some of the uh, etiquettes and manners of travels. And with that, uh, we have, alhamdulillah, completed uh, the short uh, two-week uh, session on the fiqh of traveling. Let's open up the floor for some questions, inshallah, before we conclude. I see also mentioned uh, in the in Hessian Muslim a dua in which you arrive at a place, you might not feel your security, you need the protection against the, the people, the residents, the village, and even in, maybe in some cases in jinns if you're passing through yes. a valley. Uh, so what oh, yeah, I was going to mention that as well. Right. So if you enter a place, especially um, you know, a strange place, hotel, or a place that has not been inhabited for a while, all right, uh, there's general du'as, so which seeking refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A'udhu bi kalimati Allah al-tamat min sharri ma khalaq. You say that, right? A'udhu bi kalimati Allah al-tamat min sharri ma khalaq. I seek refuge in the perfect words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the evil in which he is created. Right? So this is a general dhikr that you can say uh, that if you're entering any strange place, any strange place is the du'a for uh, protection. Uh, and if you're entering any of these strange places as well, or a place that has not been inhabited, inhabited for a while, it might also be a good idea to recite Surah Al-Baqarah, right? Because Rasulullah says that the house in which Surah Al-Baqarah is recited, the, the shaitan does not enter. The shaitan does not enter in the house in which Surah Al-Baqarah has not, uh, is recited. So, you know, sometimes you might go to like um, a vacation home or something like that. Nobody, you haven't been there for months, you know? Who, who knows what kind of jinn is, you know, taking, you know, uh, what, what do they call it when... Um, When, when people, they, t they, they, they move into your house without permission. Squatters, right? You, know, you never know there's a squatter, a squatter jinn around, right, who's, who's inhabiting your house. So 
uh, you, you know, you, uh, it's good to uh, write Surah Al-Baqarah as well, uh, because Rasulullah says that the house in which Surah Al-Baqarah is recited, that the shaitan does not enter. The entire, the entire surah, or if you recite part of it? Uh, the hadith mentions Surah Al-Baqarah, if you can recite the entire surah. Better. If not, okay. then inshallah, you know, you'll get something from it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> or you can play it. I mean, it's, yeah. it counts as recitation, inshallah. All right, any other questions? Yes. So, you know, about that traveling alone and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. like, does that come in? Just about the etiquette of traveling alone. Uh, does that come out of a time when travel alone was difficult or dangerous? I mean, I could see that making sense when you're traveling in the desert by yourself, right? But if a man and his wife are going on a honeymoon, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, like, it'd right. be awkward to say that there's two shaitans there, right? When you're right. traveling in a plane full of people, which some people might say is a, an interesting situation. but Right, of course, yeah. So, I mean, we could say that those, these hadith are, are, are a time when traveling was dangerous, Right, uh, danger. There was legitimate danger on the road. You might be attacked by bandits and so on. So we can definitely say that. Nonetheless, it still re remains a recommendation because there is good in, in company. There is good in company, um, especially pious company. So it might not necessarily be disliked, but it's still a recommendation that you travel with somebody because then this will help you. Uh, even for something such as like waking up for salat, waking up for salat al fajr, it's a lot easier to wake up with a few people around than one person is there. So it still remains a recommendation, although we can, of course we can say that uh, these hadith were, were said at a time when traveling was a legitimate uh, danger to, to people. Allah Yeah, I just want to go back a little bit. If you're working, you know, you do like deliveries, right? Mm -hmm. And you go 50 miles. You shorten it, you can shorten salat, right? If you're working, right? Mm -hmm. And then if you leave that spot and you go to a different spot, you know, a different place of delivery, you know, like 10, 10 or 15 miles, you shorten it again, right? You can shorten it again? Well, you never really came out of, of being a state of traveler, all right? So you travel 50 miles. You travel 50 miles, yeah. So, you, so once you intended to travel that, that distance, you're a traveler, and you're, you're, you remain a traveler until you return to your your, des your, your town, your destination. So until then, you're still a traveler. Oh, so if you go to a different, to a, a, right, yeah. a second destination or third, you're still in, in, in that ruling of being a traveler. Okay. All right, so any other questions? Yes. Yeah, so the question is, you want to repeat your question? So the question is about joining, can you join Jum'ah with uh, Asr? Right? Uh, as we, there is a difference of opinion amongst the scholars, but inshallah it is okay to join Dhuhr because uh, the, the Jum'ah is replacing Dhuhr. So you can make that uh, intention to join the, the Asr after, after you play Jum'ah with the conditions that we mentioned before. With the conditions that we mentioned before. Wallahu a'ala. All right, so with that we'll conclude. Jazakumullah khayran. Sallallahu wa sallam. Mubarak ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Uh, inshallah we will uh, be keeping updated with the, the next session, next class, which will be after the, um, the July 4th holiday break. Yeah. So inshallah the, the next session we're going to be discussing uh, the importance of intention and sincerity. We'll, go, we'll be going over uh, the chapter on sincerity and intention from the book of Imam al-Nawi, Riyadh al-Salihin. All right, uh, so this will be the next topic uh, concerning intention. What is the difference between sincerity and intention? Uh, when do you have to make the intention? All right, uh, combining intentions together. All these will be discussed, inshallah, uh, in the next session. And we'll be posting some announcements of when that will begin, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. Yeah. Okay, mashallah, yes. Uh, we have snacks in the back. Um, we have snacks in the back for everyone, inshallah. So uh, before the Maghrib Salah, you, you can make your way to the back and uh, take part in the snacks, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.